Should you take part in the American dream and buy a house? Or should you rent? Keep listening to find out. Welcome to the Money Meets Medicine podcast, where we talk all about the personal finance topics you wish you had learned in medical school. I'm your host, Justin Harvey, and here is your co-host, who lived in the same house from medical school through the first two years of being an attending physician, Dr. Jimmy Turner. Yeah, yeah, that was actually an interesting experience. So uh, not so much as a medical student. So, you know, for those that don't know my background, I went to med school residency fellowship all at Wake Forest. I'm an attending there now on faculty. Got my associate professor as of last July. Uh, so stoked about that. That's the end of my uh, professional journey, most likely. Yeah, thanks. Um, but we, we bought a house my second year of medical school after my wife and I got married. And then we stayed there, right? Matched for residency, stayed there. And then um, as I was paying off my student loans, we didn't do loan forgiveness. So we paid off you know, $200,000 in 19 months by staying in this small 1,100 square foot starter home. So it was actually pretty hilarious because people would you know, come over and uh, knowing that I'm an attending physician making you know, three or $400,000 and uh, in this house that had a $900 mortgage payment and one car garage and fitting a family of five and a couple of dogs was extremely challenging. And they'd be like, oh, this is quaint. This is nice. you know." And like you just kind of tell their surprise at an attending physician living in this house. That's actually one of the ways that we accomplished our financial goals early on. And so like small house, but you know, big financial gains from our perspective. I mentioned that story though, and I wanted to just divulge that at the beginning because I personally bought a house when I was in medical school. And so we're going to talk a lot about buying a house versus renting, Justin. And and I think it's important to, to kind of disclose like what my own personal experience is. Did, did you buy a house when you guys were in residency med school? So I owned a house. Sarah and I met when she was third year med school and we started this long distance thing. I was in Philadelphia. She was in Portland. <clears throat> and uh, eventually she matched in Philly. She moved to Philly and um, she had an apartment in Philadelphia for a little while. We got married. And I, I similarly, I had a 1200 square foot little row home that I had renovated with my own two hands over very slowly and painfully over a couple of years. And I did what they, what they call house hacking. <laughs> Uh, which is like, fix it up yourself, cheap debt. My parents helped me with um, the financing, uh, get a couple of friends to rent it out and then do a refi, pay back my parents and then um, earn the sweat equity along the way. I'm so glad I did that. I will never do it again, but uh, <laughs> it was a great experience and a great financial decision. Um, I will say, as I think about my own personal experience, and I remember that first year when Sarah had just moved to Philly and everyone probably remembers intern year, I think of it as like the dark night of the soul with like those month of Q3 call. And I just think ugh, it, it, you know, it, it breaks you down at the most mm. basic levels. And I can't imagine, you know, I think about somebody moving, especially if you don't know anyone in the place where you're moving to, if you have to like find someone to fix your doorbell, some random stupid thing, you're like, how the heck am I going to, you know, <laughs> start Googling handy, best handyman on Google to do some random thing like that. But those are the things that it's nice to not have to deal with. When you're, you know, PGY one. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree, and and so I'm super excited to to dive into the show, given that you both of, you know, us have bought a home, and maybe our recommendation could or could not be different. You'll have to listen to the whole show to find out uh, what our thoughts are on buying versus renting right now. But before we dive too much uh, further in, you know, in, in my opinion, Justin, there are three tasks every physician in training and residency fellowship should do when it comes to finances, right? They need to build a financial literacy, which hopefully you're doing on Money Meets Medicine podcast, listening to this. Hopefully you've gone and downloaded the book at moneymeetsmedicine.com. I think people need own occupation disability insurance because you don't want to miss out on the guarantee policy that you only have in training and you need to create a student loan plan. And so for me at Money Meets Medicine, that's that's what we're you know trying to build. And so if you want help with your own occupation disability insurance, you want to increase your financial literacy or you need help with your student loans, you can find all three of those things at moneymeetsmedicine.com. Happy to help you figure out solutions for either of those three things. I guess you say all of those three things. So Justin, we both bought houses, right? I think it's interesting when you look at the stats on this. Right? It's a home ownership in the United States, about 70%, two thirds, 66% to be precise of Americans own a home. The three lowest states of home ownership, this is not surprising, right? Highest cost of living states, California, New York, Hawaii. Uh, are three of the lowest. And uh, to put this in perspective, th this conversation today, right? If you're listening to this episode two years from now, may be different, right? And two years ago, three years ago, it maybe would have been different. And, and part of the reason why is two part, right? House prices and interest rates. 
So I actually looked at the numbers in like preparation for the show. So house prices have risen 40% from 2020 to mid 2022. And then they've been 4.4% higher since then. That's so depressing. Yeah. Right. I'm renting now, by the way. So we moved back to the West coast. I don't own a home anymore. And we've watched the market run away from us, which is a decision that I'm totally good with because it was the right decision. But I am on the wrong end of this now as a well, renter. So, well, you know, I, I think it's interesting because it depends on what you did with the money, the, the difference between the two. But we'll, we'll not put the cart ahead of the horse here. Yep. So, but I do, I do think it's interesting that you, a certified financial planner, married to a high earning physician, you're renting. So, I think that that gives some credo to to what we're going to talk about. But just to flesh out these interest rate numbers, and then we'll we'll dive back into what you're going to say. So, the annual average in March of 2024. Right when we're recording this, it's seven point five percent. So it's March of twenty twenty four, seven point five percent compared to three point six percent in twenty seventeen. And actually, at some points, it was lower. I remember we refinanced down to three percent. Um, and so we have like, I want to say our our home back when we bought it in twenty seventeen was four hundred fifty thousand dollars, and then uh, we refinanced from like four point five to like three percent. And uh, and and so like for for us, like we're we're on the golden side of this thing, but at the same time, if I moved. Right now, I'd rent. Right, so I bought a house twice, and I'd still rent right now if we moved. So, you're a renter, Justin. What What are your thoughts being on the other side of that? Did Did you invest the difference? Like we're gonna talk about mortgage versus, you know, rent and how those. That's not exactly apples to apples, but yeah, I. So I. I mean, I remember helping clients get the I, like the ones who are doing getting aggressive and doing the 15 year because you cut off a ton of interest. I remember like the low to mid twos for many clients. And uh, those are insane, like below the long-term inflation rates, which is just bonkers that rates are that low and would love to see them dip again, but it's hard to imagine that happening soon, but who knows? Um, Yeah. And so I'm totally at peace with our decision. And a lot of it has to do with kind of what we're going to talk about, but the, the, uh, again, I was a little burned out, like renovating this house and then getting your house ready to sell. I don't know if you've ever done that, but it's um, yep. it's a whole second job. And so mm-hmm. I I love not having to deal with any of that. And, you know, there's little things that if I owned this place, I would want to make it a little nicer. But I'm we really like our house. And I'm totally content to just let most of the little stuff go. And for the big stuff, just call the landlord and have them come fix it. And especially in light of interest rates. And this is one point that I like to bring clients back to when I when I'm making the case for renting and they're moving and they're getting that big attending paycheck and they're like, all right, I want to own my own piece of dirt. There's a couple qualitative and a couple quantitative reasons not to qualitatively, like your job better work out and you don't want to have a big ball and chain uh, economically that is illiquid. It's hard to sell if you have to leave your job and have a bad non-compete and, and all those things. But quantitatively, one of the reasons that it's it, one of the dynamics that's important to understand is the way an amortization schedule works for a mortgage. So if you've got a 30 year mortgage, you pay all the interest up front and the interest gets, goes down and down over time. And each payment, you know, you're, you have a fixed payment, call it $10,000 a month. We'll just use round numbers. If you're paying $10,000 a month, probably, you know, 8,700 of that is going to be interest. And you know, you've got your um, insurance and your taxes is, are going to be part of that as well. And a very small fraction is principal. So you're not really building equity. You're just lighting money on fire on the front end. And so this is a, you know, people say, I don't want to throw money away on rent. And I say, well, what about throwing away money, you know, to the bank and to the insurance company on, on purchasing? That's kind of a, you got to look at both of those and hold them both up at the same time to see if paying rent is really quote unquote, throwing money away. Yeah, no, I I agree. And, And I think that because people just want a simple decision, they look at this the wrong way. Like they look at what is the mortgage and what is the rent? And they're like, oh, from a monthly cash flow standpoint, maybe they're like, they're the same. And so like, I'd rather own a home if they're going to be the same, or maybe rent's slightly more expensive. And so I, I, I think that for multiple reasons, some of which you you included a second ago, people don't really include the full cost of home ownership. And so, for example, when we moved into our $450,000 house, which by the way, I know that I'm saying that number and we've got like listeners from like California and New York are like wanting to like punch me through the microphone. Like <laughs> I totally, I totally get that. I live in, uh, let's just say a suburb of a very small city. Uh, and so, you know, we, we have a different situation than, than a lot of the listeners. That's some of the hosts. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> 
Yeah, di- different over on the uh, the Pacific Northwest. But I, I will say that, you know, people don't take into account all of the other things, right? We moved into our house and then we have two air conditioning units because there's a basement, the, the floor that you walk in on, and then we have the, the upstairs where our kids' rooms are. And we have two air conditioners. And I, I kid you not, like two months after moving into the house, first air conditioner blows, five grand. Nine months later, second air conditioner blows, another five grand, right? So we put $10,000 into a forty, you know, $450,000 house in like less than 12 months, just in air conditioners. And if I was renting said house, that is $10,000 that I could have kept in my pocket and invested in the market. And so I wasn't able to do that. We weren't able to do that because of, of that expense. You know, there's also repairs. There's also, you know, let's just say maintenance. There's improvements, right? You can expect to put, I don't know, classically, they say like 1% or 2% of, you know, whatever your, your mortgage is, or excuse me, your house prices each year into maintenance or repair. So for my house, that'd be five to $10,000. So maybe I shouldn't have been shocked by the AC going out, uh, but it was not planned. And so, you know, all that to say, like when you're, when you're going to try to make this apples to oranges comparison as apples to apples as you can get, you've got to add in all of those costs, right? So like just, just add in one to 2% of your home price on top of your mortgage, right? And then potentially add in the other number that you just mentioned, which is selling a home. And I think that that one may be even more important, Justin, because a lot of people, I mean, they're, you're human, like people listening to this podcast, you are not robots, right? As far as I know, you're not robots. Maybe maybe some of those download numbers are, you know, <laughs> robots of like the four to 5,000 people that listen. But at the same time, because you're not a robot, you're like, ah, American dream, I want to own a home. This is the, the right house and this is my dream job. And like you tell yourself all these positive things, not realizing that 50% of people change jobs in the first three to five years after taking a job as a physician. And so I can't tell you in academics how often I've had somebody, quote unquote, go take their dream job out of residency just to come and interview back at Wake in the first one to three years after their first job because they didn't end up liking it. And yet they bought a house and now have to pay 8% of the home price in order to get out of it. So not only burning, lighting money on fire towards interest, but now three years later, you don't have any equity in the house and you're having to sell it. You know, 8%, of your million dollar home is going to cost you $80,000 to sell. So why don't you add that number into your rent versus mortgage calculation too? Very quickly, this becomes kind of a lopsided equation, at least in my mind, in, in this current environment. Yes, no question. And, and, uh, the seller is the one, this is an important thing to understand. Like when you buy a house, you say, I'm going to offer 400 grand. Okay. 400 is the number. This is the price that you pay. And there are closing costs. Uh, but the, the bulk of the fees associated are coming from the seller. So, um, you know, you're, you'd be surprised, you know, from that list price to what actually ends up in your checking account, uh, how, uh, (laughs) how quickly those dollars evaporate. And I think you're right to consider that component. And you actually need a decent amount of appreciation to cover that. Like you better hope that the value goes up over time just so yeah, you can break and, even. And, and while we're on that, just because, you know, listeners, longtime listeners know I'm huge on conflicts of interest, right? So I, I think that it's it's highly important. So one of the ones that I like to talk about, because people don't talk about this, we love talking about insurance agents, right? By the way, every insurance agent earns commission on products when, when they're sold. That's the way the insurance products work in the United States of America. So when you have a disability insurance agent, for example, look at your policy to determine if it's good or not, they are conflicted. They, there's an incentive to sell you a new policy because they make money off of that rather than telling you, hey, keep the one that you have, right? So that's an example in the disability insurance space. You know, we've talked about financial planners, you know, I don't know, eight or 10 episodes. You can go check that one out if you want. Realtors, I think this is one people don't think about, right? So you just mentioned that the selling agent, right? The 8% that you make, 4% goes to this. Well, typically 3% goes to the selling agent, 3% goes to the buying agent, and the other 2% are typically for fees, brokers, you know, legal stuff, whatever. So three to 4% to each side, if you want to think about it that way. And your, you know, million dollar house example. If let's say it's listed for 900, you walk in, you're a human, psychology is doing its thing. You're like, this is my dream home. And you know that you'd be willing to offer a million dollars. I encourage you to never mention that to your realtor because it'll be amazing how often that person who's making money off the sale price will go and talk to the other realtor and say, Hey, you know, they really like this house. I know it's listed for 900, but you know, they're, they're, they're willing to pay a million. So maybe if you get another couple offers, you know, you might be able to come up on this thing. And so when you, it's, it is an incentive. It is a conflict of interest. Should people know what your top price is that you're willing to pay for something. And so 
I always encourage people not to say it out loud. Like you can talk to it with your, your partner, but like, don't go and advertise it to the realtors. Like, Hey, you know, we really like this house. This is what we, we'd be willing to pay. And, and that said, really, really interesting environment, Justin. I'm, I'm sure you've seen this a lot with clients, but like, I mean, there, there was a long time period and I don't know if this is still happening where people were like, we're forgoing inspections and like paying, you know, cash out of pocket to like, just basically take the house as is no questions asked. And so because of that, like, you really did feel like you had to, to, to put your top number out there, even yeah. though you didn't want to pay that. I always joked that I was like, I got in the wrong industry. Like for me to make 30 grand, I got to like really grind for my clients for a number of years right. to, to earn that kind of money. But it's like, I should have just been a listing agent on a million dollar house in a hot market and boom, just like that, you know, 30 grand. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, this is hot off the press. I just Googled this cause I was curious last year, there was a $1.8 billion class action lawsuit against the national association of realtors just today on the recording date of this episode, they settled for $418 million to address these claims of like widespread getting wow. at some of these inherent conflicts of interest that have inflated commissions allegedly inappropriately. And now they're, they're, they're not agreeing to the, you know, they're, it's a, one of those, we pay $418 million to say we didn't do anything wrong, but we want this to go away situation. So yeah. maybe that's going to change. Hopefully the average commission is going to come down. But the point is historically, this has been an important part of the, cost of transacting and you know hopefully for buyers like me in the coming days it'll be moving a little bit more in the consumer's favor yeah no that's actually really interesting i, di I didn't know that I i've i've taught that from a general education standpoint like in classes and stuff but i didn't know that that class action lawsuit was was going on when did when did that start last year uh, last fall and actually it just today there was a, a big settlement so wow look at the timing of that see that, that's just like <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm basically Nostradamus now. Yeah. Good but, job yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, I, I do think it's, um, you know, it's worth considering that conflict. It's worth adding the 8% onto, you know, that mortgage calculation when you're comparing it to rent. It's worth adding the one to 2% maintenance, upgrade, repairs, what have you. Um, it's worth adding any, like, when we moved into our house, our back deck was like, it had outdoor carpet on it. It was, gross like wow. the, entire, the entire concept of it and like it got rained on like that back deck gets rained on and so you know we wanted to you know make it i, I can't remember the name of the company but like basically that like composite wood is like trex it's not trex, trex. It, was, yep. yeah, it, was a, it was a different brand but um so we knew we were going to put you know twenty thirty thousand dollars in that back deck again knowing that we were going to do that add that onto your your mm -hmm. mortgage versus rent calculation and very quickly, you're going to see that renting actually isn't that bad. And, and there are really active proponents in this space. So Ramit Sethi is probably the most prominent one who's like just rent no matter what, just because of the flexibility and the math and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And he, and he, he said that since like the beginning of age when he came into this space. Yeah. Um, don't always agree with Ramit on everything. Me neither. But yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that said, it, it's interesting that people are still having this debate. Mm -hmm. in a high interest, high housing cost environment. And so where I get asked this question the most, Justin, is with graduating fourth year medical students and graduating residents slash fellows. And for me, it's like, if you don't know that you're not going to be in an area for at least five years, I just don't, I don't think right now, now granted personal finance is personal. I know you're going to add the caveat here in a second when I make this very outrageous comment. I don't think right now for the majority of people, that buying a home when you're going to be staying there for less than five years and or you're finishing training and you don't know if you're going to like the job slash area yet is a reasonable thing to do. I, I don't think you should buy a house in that situation. Now, rent six, 12 months, what have you. See if you like the job. See if you like the location. If you just finished training and then by all means buy a house. Yes, you have to move twice. You can add that into the calculation on the rent side if you want. But at the end of the day, it is going to be a financial faux pas. It's going to be an issue for you. If two years later, you decide that you want to yeah, you threw out that number 50%. I've heard it higher, 70 to 75, you know, change jobs in the first three or four years out of training. And so, like, if you think you're part of the 25, I mean, you might be right. You might not. The, you know, like 90% of drivers think they're better than average or whatever that stat is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, statistically, like, you, you should consider being flexible and the value of that flexibility. And uh, not to mention that, you know, the decreased stress of not having to own. An important counterpoint here that I think does warrant mentioning in terms of the financial impact is the tax deductibility of mortgage interest. So mm -hmm. $750,000 of debt up to $750,000 will create a tax deductible interest expense. So if you itemize your deductions, which 
just about every attending will, especially if you own a home, then you're going to get a deduction for that amount of interest only up to three quarters of a million. So if you buy, you know, if you're living in Manhattan, you buy like a shoebox for $1.8 million and you put just a little bit of money down. Uh, and so you have a 1.6 mortgage, only 750 of that 1.6 is going to be deductible. So there's going to be a pro ration of the interest. You know, I said, if it's a $10,000 mortgage payment, 8,300 is interest. In the, if that is your payment based on a $1.6 million mortgage, you know, you're only going to have like 4,000 a month or a little, a little less $3,800 a month. That's going to be a deductible expense that will uh, reduce your taxable income, but it does reduce your taxable income. And there is some give back from uncle Sam to continue to incentivize home ownership. So that needs to be acknowledged in this discussion. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And and for us, you know, I, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a tax expert. I'm just going to throw that out there, but like big picture, <laughs> like thinking like the way that I view taxes in my situation, at least uh, excluding business stuff. Um, the biggest tax benefits that I get, right. They're kind of four, right. So retirement accounts, mortgage interest that you just mentioned, you get the state and local tax, it's capped at $10,000 and then charitable giving. Like those are the four things that like are really as an employed physician at my disposal. And so salt taxes cap at $10,000. Almost every doctor is going to hit that one. Right. And so, you know, if you do any charitable giving, like I think our, our interest, even on our, our lower cost house is like 12 or $13,000 per year. Um, and so all of a sudden I'm at 23. Well, man, now I'm getting pretty close to that standard deduction. So any charitable giving that I get bumps me over that every single year. Uh, and so because of that, honestly, if we weren't in the situation of owning a home, if we were just doing our tithing and we were just doing our salt tax, I mean, we would just, you know, be like just over the, you know, the threshold mm -hmm. for, for the standard deduction in our house. Um, and it wouldn't make as much sense, right? For us, we, yeah. we might start doing that situation where like, we're going to, we're going to double tithe one year and then we're going to not tithe at all the next year to take advantage of that standard deduction, actually deduct the same amount of taxes and give the same amount of money, but then benefit from a tax standpoint more. Um, and so we, we don't do that. And the reason we don't is because of mortgage. It's because of the interest. This is an important point. And so you want to consider not what is the total, you know, it's not like the whole, if I paid $35,000 of mortgage interest, that whole 35 is going to come back to me. It's actually, you want to think about marginal impact. So for example, if you're a high income couple living in Texas and you're renting and you go from renting to you want to buy a place. You don't pay any state income tax. You're going to pay property tax that may be deductible depending on how much property taxes. That's only going to get you part of the way there. You may not hit your salt limit, um, which is $10,000. The standard deduction for a married couple is $28,000. So the first 18, 20 grand of your mortgage interest is going to be sort of excluded in terms of benefit. So the only benefit you're getting is on the marginal dollars above the standard deduction. So certainly think this, if you're like, oh, tax deductible interest, like it's free money, like, well, it depends, depends on how much, not. it depends on how much of the standard deduction you're already using. So if you're charitably inclined, if you live in a high, you know, if you can max out the salt cap of 10 grand state and local tax salt, that's the acronym there. I'm in Oregon. Multnomah County is the worst tax jurisdiction for making income in certain levels of income in America. I have discovered, and I welcome anyone to challenge me on that. And this includes New York and San Francisco. And maybe I can learn something, but I, I'm pretty sure this is true. Um, so because we max the salt and, you know, we have some charity happening when we go to buy, uh, we'll stand to benefit from almost all of that, um, the marginal dollars above and beyond the standard deduction for a joint filer. But make sure that this makes sense for you. And it's good to understand before you say, yes, I want to do this because of the tax deduction. Like make sure how much of that you're going to capture first. Yep, absolutely. And and so J Justin, are, are there any other things that you'd consider in the in the rent versus buy conversation? Right. So we've talked about things you need to add to the mortgage side, you know, the eight percent sales, talked about, you know, some some other things in terms of upkeep, maintenance, and you know, on the rent side, we talked about don't forget about the mortgage interest you get to deduct if you own. What are some other considerations? Are there any we left on the table? Well, I'm going to bring it full circle. And I'm going to say the biggest reason that I want to buy a house is twofold. One, so I can build an ADU to put a home office in and also build a man cave to my own specifications. And I can do neither of those while I'm renting. <laughs> and uh, that's it's a non-financial, non-quantitative consideration. But 
there are times in which that's literally the most important thing. And I'm not at the point where the, the pain of not having a man cave to my own specifications is going to drive me to, to buy a house. But there are people who a sense of belonging in a community with roots is the predominant consideration. And there's no amount of quantification to the quant to the contrary that can or, or really needs to counteract it. Like if you want to buy, it's a personal decision. People say home ownership is an investment. Like it's not, it's a lifestyle decision. It's a quality of life decision. And this is my opinion. Just if you, if you need that for your psychology, for your spouse, for your family, for your kids, like just do it and don't worry about every, the 25 minutes of what we just rambled about, because uh, I think we are wired to thrive as humans in a place where we feel like we belong. And there is uh, that that benefit is really can't be overlooked or even, I think, appropriately described because it's it's very profound. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. And, and I think that it kind of comes down to like a, a similar, you know, you're not a robot, right? Yeah. You are a psychological, sociological human being. And because of that, all these decisions aren't going to be pure math, just like paying down debt, right? Like the math may favor doing forgiveness. But in some situations, people are like, you know what? I don't want to hang on to the debt for six more years. I just want to pay it off and not have it over my head. And so mathematically, it doesn't make sense. But like from a human rationalization, psychological benefit perspective, it could. And I think buying a home, even though the math doesn't make sense, is is a situation that that, that could also apply. I still, I, I, I'll just, I'll die, I'll die on my hill for, for those fourth year med students that are, you know, going into family medicine for three years. I, I still don't think that you should buy a house unless it's just unequivocally that just and and, and just the, the thing that i struggle with and i didn't mean to open up a whole other can of worms on this but the thing that i struggle with is that i also know from like you know philosophy and psychology classes from coaching clients and from myself my own perspective right I, and I'll, I'll just throw a story out there i bought a uh boxster long time listeners know i'm a big car guy right so i bought a boxster a second car i had a truck i bought a boxster Ended up selling it. But the reason I bought the Boxster is because I was like, oh, but it'll like be a fun weekend car, put the top down. You know, it'd, it'd be a lot of fun. And, uh, and like practically speaking, I ended up finding out after I bought the car that like, oh, by the way, I, I still do have three children. And like, Kristen would be like, hey, can you, uh, can you come, like, can you pick up the kids? And I'd be like, oh, no, like physically, no, I can't unless you want to put them in the trunk. And so uh, I have two seats. Uh, and so that just didn't work. Right. So I ended up selling the Boxster. Um, and, and it was financially a, a stupid decision. It was psychologically a stupid decision, but the reason that I got there was because I rationalized myself mm -hmm. into a bad financial decision. And so my fear with home buying would be like, ah, oh, but this is the one community that I'm going to fit into. I really need that man cave is, you know, going to like potentially talk yourself into a, a bad situation. So I think if you're going to make that decision and, and you're going to bite that bullet and rationalize your way into it. I hope at least you're an attending physician who might have the income at your disposal to pay for that decision if it backfires. Whereas in training as a you know three year PGY three family medicine resident trying to leave and now you're landlording a house because you can't afford to sell it, right? Um, that, that that's going to be a very different feeling for you. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll just throw that out there. Yeah, totally agree. I think you know if you're the unicorn, where like I moved away from med school, I got married. I want to come back home for residency and I want to be here until I die. And my family's here and my spouse's family's here and I have a stay at home spouse and they're going to find someone to fix the doorbell whenever the doorbell breaks. And we're, we have two kids and we're just ready to do this thing. Sure. Yeah. Okay. You get an exemption, but the other 97% of people out there, I would pretty strongly say like, let's talk about this. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Well, hopefully, you know, timing of the show, we're recording this literally the day of match. Uh, so for all the fourth year oh, medical yeah. students, Happy listening match to this, day. yeah, post, Post-match, it'll be in April when this comes out, but congratulations. As you're sorting this decision out with the timing of the show, maybe it'll be helpful to you. And if not, please share this with somebody that's graduating residency fellowship or a fourth-year medical student who could benefit from thinking through this conversation. Otherwise, make sure to visit moneymeetsmedicine.com, download a free copy of the book, get help with your own occupation, disability insurance, or your student loans. Happy to help you with any of those three things at moneymeetsmedicine.com. Otherwise, we will see you next week. Cheers. Justin Harvey is a certified financial planner at APM Wealth, where he helps anesthesiologists and pain medicine physicians. Dr. Jimmy Turner is a practicing academic anesthesiologist at Wake Forest in North Carolina. He's also a licensed insurance agent. However, neither Justin or Jimmy are your financial planner, investment advisor, or insurance agent. 
This show is expressly for general education and entertainment purposes only. Nothing should be considered financial advice. All views expressed are solely the views of the guests on the show and do not represent the views or opinions of their employer.